Greetings. These short clips, I call them Christian treasures, for we think about the things that have been lost or perhaps forgotten. And really, it's Philippians 4, 8 that is the motivation. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And this is the second message looking at an interview in Christianity Today back in uh, February of 1980, where Mr. Henry is interviewing the famous uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. We're going to be looking at six questions that really involve uh, the ministry at Westminster Chapel during World War II. And the very first question from Mr. Henry, referring to G. Campbell Morgan, uh, the question is, what is it like to labor in the shadows of such a giant? And the doctor replies, he was a great pulpit master. In many ways, the greatest I've ever heard. He was also a very kind and very generous man. But I always wanted to be myself. I never wanted to duplicate him or any other preacher. My main concern was to convey the message to the best of my ability. I believed the message and that God would honor my efforts. Between us, we alternated morning and evening services monthly. Our co congregations were almost identical in number during the entire year we ministered together before the war. Mr. Henry then asked, what impact did World War II have? The doctor. It was shattering. I well remember Sunday morning, September 3rd, 1939. A radio bulletin was to be given at 11 a.m., so we delayed the service until the unsettling announcement came. War. Immediately, everyone expected air raids over London. Since our chapel had no facilities for sheltering people, we dismissed the congregation. That very day, in fact, an air raid warning sounded though it was a false alarm. People who could move out of London did so, and our congregation dwindled to about 300. We blacked out the church windows and moved the evening services to mid-afternoon. In a flying bomb attack, a bomb dropped just across the road in June of 1944 and blew off half the chapel roof, so that for 14 weeks we met in a borrowed hall with about 150 people. Only 100 to 200 were left of Campbell Morgan's great congregation. Campbell Morgan retired in 1943 and died in 1945. Mr. Henry asked, Were you ever discouraged to the point of wanting to forego a pulpit ministry? The doctor, No, never. During the war, I traveled extensively throughout Britain at least two days a week, for a combined meetings or special services. In 1947, many people urged me to take the superintendent of the forward movement of the Welsh Presbyterian Church position, but I stayed in war-scored London. The congregation had slowly begun to build, and at war's end, roughly 500 people attended quite regularly. Mr. Henry, once the na Nazis were repelled, what happened? The doctor. People began to return to London, but we lost the vast majority of our membership. The pre-war remnant that remained was middle-aged and elderly. We developed a virtually new congregation. In 1948, attendance reached 13 to 1,400 people and we opened the first gallery. The National Centenary Exposition in 1951 brought throngs to London, and for the first time since Campbell Morgan's day, the chapel was again completely filled as 2,500 persons at times crowded the auditorium, the first gallery, and balcony. Question. If not in numbers, how does one then measure the effectiveness of such a large pulpit ministry? The doctor. By an atmosphere of expectancy in the service, for one thing, we placed notices in the pews that the minister was available for a private conference after each service. 
I spent well over an hour after service after service with individuals seeking conversion or counsel. Question. Word reached America that because you were not only steeped in scripture but also abreast of medicine, science, and history, non-evangelical intellectuals were attracted to your preaching. The doctor. I was invited to speak at the InterVarsity Fellowship Conference in 1936. During the, year, the war years, I served as their president. Students came in large numbers, especially after the war. The New Testament scholar Professor R. V. G. Tasker attended on Sunday nights. He forsook liberalism and told me that under my ministry, he became convinced of original sin and the wrath of God. And that led to a complete change. They were others in whom an evangelical faith was revived. Mm. You know, there's just nothing more important, I think, than listening to those that are near the end of their lives. Like, for example, if you wanted to know what Peter was thinking, well, we, we can read his epistles. Same with Apostle John, his epistles. And then if I remember correctly, I think 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are the final words of Apostle Paul. And here we have this wonderful interview within a year of the doctor's uh, death, um, sharing uh, his uh, memories of the past and his thoughts of the future. So we'll end this week right here. And next week, we'll be looking at the doctor's thoughts on the subject of revival and evangelism. Until then, Grace upon grace be with you all.